Hi. Hi, is that Lyndall? Yeah, it is. Hi, Lyndall. Got connected. Excellent. So, um, have you got some slides that you're going to be sharing? Uh, yes, I can do that. Yeah, so, um, we've got an hour slot here. Yeah, we've got an hour slot, Lyndall, so it's, uh, you, 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 we're, we're not rushing into another speaker after you. So, just take your time to get yourself set up. Oh, uh, but I have a meeting. You have a meeting. Okay, <laughs> then hurry up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. All right. Glad you resolved the issues with the link. Um, I'll. So this is Lyndall from the Black Dog Institute on Saturday, and I'll just hand over to her for the lunchtime lecture on the lifespan suicide prevention trials. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, it was a last-minute invitation, but I saw the list of speakers, and a lot of them. Uh, um, people we've been working with a lot in the last few years as part of the national trials. Um, Ray and Jackie and Rachel and also a number of organisations that have been working peripherally with the trials. So it was, I was really keen to come in and try to connect some of those dots with some updates around the lifespan trials. Uh, so my name is Lyndall Halliday. I work on the National Suicide Prevention Team and I used to work on the New South Wales lifespan team as well. And we work to bring down the suicide rate in Australia, primarily through supporting um, regions to develop um, actions and plans and best practice implementation for suicide prevention work. Um, so today I'm going to just give you a little overview of the trials that Black Dog has supported, and in particular the New South Wales High Fidelity Lifespan Trials. We have some preliminary findings as they relate to men. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the National Suicide Prevention Trials and I think the really clear thing from this is the diversity of men across Australia. Um, we've got some implementation learnings to share about that and then I also want to have a little quick snapshot of some of the work that Black Dog's doing in men's suicide prevention. Um, Here's some statistics on suicide. Um, this entire audience will be very familiar with this sort of work um, and these numbers and the crucial number here is that um, male suicide across the last 10 years is approximately three times higher than females. It's uh, a national tragedy that we are all working hard to decrease. Um, there are other tragedies in this data. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander obviously are obviously overrepresented, LGBTI people are overrepresented and again I think this points to the diversity of men in this conversation. Um, so one of the issues that Black Dog identified quite a few years ago is that they felt that a lot of suicide prevention work in Australia was quite fragmented and often maybe a lot of energy was going to things which didn't have a great evidence base or had a limited impact on suicide um, rates. And I think some of that was really around community readiness as well, around awareness raising and things like that. So looking at international evidence and different frameworks, um, the Black Dog developed this lifespan model, which uh, a lot of you in the PHN land will be quite familiar with. Uh, it looks at nine evidence-based strategies um, implemented at the same time. And as I said before, the purpose is really about defragmenting um, suicide prevention work and having it quite targeted. Yes? Um, for some reason, we're just seeing a half of your slide on the screen. Ah, oh. which half? The good half? Or uh, the... Seeing that it looks like the left hand side. Well, it changes every, it, it depends, it's it, one minute. So, yeah, it's generally the left side we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing the lifespan model, but not seeing much of your graphic there. So, is that PowerPoint? All right, I'll just, yeah, it is PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I'll try stop sharing and then I'll reshare. Okay. All right. I'll try resharing again. And I'm sorry, I can't look at the comments when. Um, no, that's fine. I'm sharing my screen. So if anything, questions come up, yeah. You will take a record of those for you, no worries. All right. <laughs> right. 
Is that better? No, it's gone the same way. So maybe what we could do is just, um, if you push escape to go back to the slides, yeah, that, and then maybe, yeah, it seems to be, maybe just drag your, yeah, drag that down. I think that'll be okay. We'll be able to see that. All right. Well, we can share it afterwards as well if people want to see it more closely. All right. Um, so as I was saying, it's based on these nine intervention areas that have a fairly reasonable, some quite strong, some less strong evidence base around suicide prevention. And the idea is to um, bring different sectors together, different parts of the system together to um, bring about that suicide prevention work. Um, it's really about forming a safety net. So the areas are improving crisis and aftercare, treatments, primary care, frontline workers, working with young people in schools, training the community, um, community campaigns, safe media reporting and um, means restriction and means safety. But also a really important part of the lifespan model, which is less about RCT evidence and more about best practice ways of working. Um, really looking at things like uh, making sure lived experience engagement and cultural governance and inclusion, um, community ownership and adaptation exists for this model. So that's that framework. Oh, also the... Um, Go. Um, and in developing this model, the researchers looked at the weighting of the strategies. Um, so not all strategies are equal in regards to the predictions around deaths and attempts. Um, for attempts, some of the biggest impact strategies are aftercare and crisis care, treatments, school programs and means restriction. And for deaths, some of the priority um, or the more weighted strategies are GP, capacity building, treatments, gatekeeper training, so community programs like um, assist or QPR, means restriction, things like that. But I'll point out that this is a universal model. This isn't a model which has been specifically targeted for men. So if we were to think about the weighting of these strategies, we might start looking at things like GPs and community training and means restriction as maybe having a bit more of an impact when it comes to men given um, health and help seeking is lower and um, lethality of means is, is higher. So Black Dog over the last four or five years has supported 29 trial sites, um, four are in New South Wales, they're the high fidelity, we call them high fidelity trial sites because they have to implement this lifespan model in a fairly rigid way. Um, which has not been easy for them, and we've learnt a lot in that process, both us and our trial sites. It's funded by the Paul Ramsey Foundation, and um, those I'll talk about those sites in more detail in a few minutes. We have the 12 national trials. Uh, this was funded by the Department of Health. Um, now, they aren't implementing lifespan explicitly. The mandate well, the remit, sorry, was to implement systems approaches and we're um, funded to support them to do that. And in implementing different systems approaches, all of these 12 trial sites have different priority populations. Some of them are men specifically. Uh, in Victoria, we have supported their 12 place-based trials. We supported them until last year, but they've also had a trial extension for two years and loosely they're implementing lifespan. And then the ACT came on board as a sort of an additional high fidelity research trial site related to New South Wales. So the New South Wales trial sites are Newcastle, Central Coast, Illawarra, Shoalhaven and Murrumbidgee. And these are LHD and PHN led collaboratives. Um, I'm just pointing this out because systems, suicide prevention work can't be done as singular organisations. It really has to be collaborative across the organisations in the region. Um, the trials are following a step wedge design. They started roughly four months apart or three months apart from each other. So we should see a stepped decline, hopefully, in deaths and attempts over the years. They've all finished their active implementation stage and now our research and data team is engaged in two years of follow-up with those trial sites. So some of the primary outcomes for lifespan as they relate to men. As I said, this is a universal in, um, program, but obviously we will look at it along um, demographic data. So the primary outcome for lifespan is 
looking for a change in suicide attempts and deaths over time. And we will look at that overall for the whole community. And we'll also look at that for men and women. And with the data we're using is um, linking up emergency department, ambulance, admitted patient and coronial data. Um, another key um, research is uh, a lot of the secondary um, outcomes around stigma reduction and awareness and help seeking. Um, so we have QPR gatekeeper training, QPR question persuade refer. It's a one hour online program and that's been rolled out across um, those trial sites. We haven't done the analysis yet. Um, that's about to start and it will look at the differences between men and women in completing the training in the pre and post outcomes on confidence and help seeking, things like that. The community survey, we currently have eight and a half thousand respondents to this. This is just general community understanding of suicide and um, those types of outcomes. Um, and again, the plan is to look at gender differences, the stigma, knowledge, suicide ideation, and those other secondary outcomes. So in short, we haven't done that analysis yet for men for those um, uh, research projects. Now in these a few other projects as part of that trial, um, there's the RESTORE study, which is a longitudinal study looking at the experience of people who um, present at emergency department for a suicidal crisis. Um, we've had almost 900 people enrolled in that study so far and as you'd expect, majority of participants in that survey were women and this does reflect um, the data around attempts and deaths um, of men and women in suicide prevention work but um, so far there aren't any differences in men and women's willingness to return to the ED for future crises um, or attendance at pre range follow-up appointments so that um, engagement remains the same across the demographics there um, and there are more future plans to look at how men and women experience the ED. Uh, one bit of data which I haven't included here, which does relate to men's suicide prevention, is around 40% of the people in this study identify as LGBTI. So I think, again, this points to the diversity of the Australian community when we think about men and women. Um, Another study is the Youth Aware of Mental Health study. This is um, Youth Aware of Mental Health is a youth program which goes into schools. We've had incredible support from the Department of Education in implementing this in all public schools in um, those trial regions. I think it's close to 100 public schools. Um, this is what I mean by it can't be done as one organisation. I mean, you really need um, collab collaboration to get this sort of work happening. Um, and what we've found there is um, no significant differences in the rates of suicide ideation or self-harm at baseline and no differences in outcomes of follow-up. So um, the young men and women, the year nine students are experiencing the same benefits of this program. Um, and this is consistent with the original randomised control trial in Europe of about 13,000 young people. So it's good we're getting a replication of those results. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Trials are a different bag. They are not implementing lifespan in a rigid way. There's 12 of them. I've got the map up there um, in every state and territory. Um, Brisbane North, Country South Australia, Darwin, Kimberley, Midwest WA, North Coast New South Wales, Northwest Melbourne, Perth South, Sunshine Coast, Wide Bay and Gympie area. Um, northern parts of Tasmania, Townsville and western New South Wales. And as I said before, they're all implementing a mixture of systems approaches. We're not evaluating it, the University of Melbourne's evaluating it. So we're supporting them with best practice, what we've learned around evidence and implementation um, in suicide prevention work over the years. And so the different models, there's the lifespan model, there's the European Alliance Against Depression being implemented in WA. And of course, many of the sites have taken up recommendations from the important Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention Evaluation Project. And quite a number of the sites have taken the lifespan model, sort of pulled it apart and rebuilt it in a way which is more suited to their communities. And a really, really key part of this work is that each of the trial sites have different priority populations which I'll show on the next slide. 
So these are the sites and their priority populations. Um, half of them are focused on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, two are LGBTI, um, which is Brisbane and Northwest Melbourne. Young people feature in a lot of them, men specifically feature in country South Australia, Midwest WA, I think you guys heard from um, Jackie this morning. Um, Sunshine Coast area, Tasmania, um, Western New South Wales and Townsville as well with their veteran population. Um, but I think as well, what's really important about this slide is just seeing that, as I've said a few times already, that men are represented in all these priority populations. So even though men are specifically a group being looked at in Midwest WA, or country South Australia, you can't do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicide prevention without looking at the men in that group. And you can't do LGBTI suicide prevention without looking at the men in that group. And you can't look at young people's suicide prevention without looking at the experience of young men and teenagers in this uh, group. And the same with defence. So um, yeah, it's, it's a very diverse um, variety of populations and men are absolutely across all of them. Um, and sort of on that point, and the way that lifespan's been adapted or any model's been adapted in the national trials is really looking at the unique needs in specific communities and populations. A systems approach model, they're often developed overseas, they're developed in research institutes in Sydney, um, and they're not always appropriate in the generic format without consideration of the target community. There's no point us telling a community they need to put a, you know, audit their emergency department procedures if they don't have a hospital with an emergency department. So it's really a matter of looking at what the community has and what they need and what they're ready to implement. Um, but the core of lifespan and any systems approach remains and it's about implementing multiple strategies at once. It's about creating that um, safety net using as much evidence as we have, um, implementing multiple programs across the sectors, health, education, community, and again, really remembering those guiding principles around lived experience, inclusion, cultural governance, community ownership, and things like that. Um, just a little quick aside, uh, one of the really important parts about our work is sort of getting as much data and using it in really effective ways. Illawarra Shellhaven had a catchphrase, which was, um, reality, not rumour. And often what happens in a community, there's a, there's a tragic death, it might be a young person, and the community really rallies around that in grief and they want to do something. But if you look at the data, the need might really be middle-aged men or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander men. So you really need to use data effectively to develop and target your, your suicide prevention activities. Um, I'm going to show you some data from a region we're working with. They're not actually a trial site, but um, this is just really high level demographic data, which will see how you need to unpack it to think about how to target men in a community. Um, so I'm calling them region A. In the previous 10 years, there've been roughly 450, um, 430 suicide deaths in the community and by far the majority of men. Um, this is not unusual, but what is disturbing is this community has a higher rate for men's suicide than the national average. It's sitting at 28.2, where the national is 17.1. Um, and looking at that age breakdown, there's not a group of men there you'd want to exclude in thinking or deprioritize in thinking about suicide prevention activity and planning. I mean, the men 75 to 84 have a lower number, but you know, basically from 75 down to 15, they all need to be prioritized. The 35 to 44 age group is obviously the highest, but the other ones on either side and around it are still very, very high. So um, it's a fairly even distribution. And so men across the lifespan here, small L lifespan need support in this community. Another really interesting uh, bit of demographic data for this community is the average Torres Strait Islander suicide death is 11.4%. Um, and it is um, roughly reasonably less than the national average. It's sitting on 19.6, the rate per 100,000. And that's less than the national average of 24.1. 
Um, and so I think that's a really important piece of information. I think we can, in this community, the PHN or the collaborative would need to figure, okay, well, what's working for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community? What are the protective factors here that are helping them keep their men safer than other communities? So um, really working with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community there to, to find out what's working and to um, look at span those protective factors to, to continue to bring that, um, that rate down. Um, and here's some other statistics that we often see thrown around about um, men and their particular um, demographics, their socioeconomic status or their marital status when it comes to suicide deaths um, and their level of sort of distress and, and support in their lives. So if you look at these numbers again, it's kind of tricky to figure out exactly where you'd want to focus. Um, you've got roughly a third never married, a third married, and a third whose relationship has somehow ended. So thinking about how you would find your men there in that group and where you can give them the support and intervene in a, in a preventative way is, is a really interesting problem. Um, I will point out that the rate, I haven't included it here because my data team wouldn't let me, so don't tell them I'm telling you, but the rate for separated men was actually really high. So even though the number is low, it, lower at 57 the rate was very very high so you separated men are a risk group there and again at employment status um, roughly a third employed a third unemployed and the rest a mixture of student or retired or on home duties um, so again that's really interesting I think you are looking at an equal number of employed and unemployed but again if you look at the rate unemployed men have a much higher rate of suicide so um, you would absolutely want to target unemployed men in this community but if you were to ignore the employed men you would also still have a really large number of people dying unnecessarily but when thinking about the suicide prevention planning here it's really about um, you'd have to cast a wider net in targeting employed men. You'd be looking at employers, large employers, small employers, you'd be looking at banks, you'd be looking at um, community gatekeeper training. All the places where you might find employed men is a much broader net than unemployed men. But anyway, I just find it really interesting to think about how we do this sort of data analysis and drilling down to prioritise the kind of work that needs to be doing. And normally with this sort of data, we would also provide, which I can't do here, but we would provide much more granular information on um, the means that are being used, um, postcodes and hotspots would appear where people are dying and we can also overlay that with demographics, age and gender and also services. So you can kind of see in a region where there might be some obvious problems appearing when you sort of overlay all these sort of numbers. Um, all right, some learnings to date, aside from data, um, from implement, implementing systems approaches. Um, this is one of my favourite cartoons, I share it a lot. What was initially thought to be a simple process is in fact an incredibly complicated, intricate and complex system um, that we've tried to make look nice and easy with a nine strategy uh, framework or a four strategy framework with view Peter Alliance Against Depression, but it's actually very, very complex. Um, so speaking to PHNs over the last few years um, and looking at the implementation study we did around from New South Wales, what some of the key challenges has been knowing what to do has been easy, but the challenge has been how to do it. So having a framework like Lifespan has been really easy, not easy, but it's been easy to sort of guide activity, but then how to actually do it's been really challenging. Um, strategies implementing the greatest evidence can be the hardest, um, to, sorry, strategies with the greatest evidence can be hardest to implement. This would be things like crisis and aftercare services, means restriction, things like that. Um, systems change is new work and there are often limits to the change that can be achieved by primary health networks. I think our primary health network partners have done an amazing job getting collaboratives up and running and engaging with communities, but these are federally funded quasi government organisations that are being asked to engage with state bodies, police, health, schools, um, ambulance, um, justice, things like that. So these are really, it's really hard space for a primary health network to be um, influencing. Um, I think one of the trials, the, all the trials have commented on this, that a trial environment is quite 
challenging for sustainability. It can be really hard for communities to get on board because they're afraid of that money withdrawing. Um, a lot of sites are concerned about the goodwill being eroded with once this work sort of ends. And so they are spending quite a bit of time um, looking at safely transitioning, not just services that have clients attached, but also um, keeping the momentum, the really important momentum that's happening there. I think Ray Martin might, who's from Townsville, he might share a bit of information with you about how they're doing that sustainability and transition planning up in Townsville. Um, it takes a really long time to do good sort of suicide prevention work, particularly priority populations, trying to figure out what community need is, getting buy-in, getting partners to work together. It's really, really, really hard, time-consuming work. Um, and some sites are further along, but they might have had more mature collaboratives or, or a higher level of readiness than, than other communities. Um, and access to data varies across sites, as I pointed out before, having good data is really important in this space. Um, some of the successes, I think a really key thing in the PHMs has been having a dedicated suicide prevention coordinator role. These have been funded by the National Trials and the Paul Ramsey Fund. So we're really in our advocacy looking to, with government, to have these roles maintained because they're really, really important to have someone in that central role. Um, even though one of the challenges was different parts of the system coming together, it's also been one of the successes. So many sites have really seen how they've come together around their priority populations and all the different services working together. Um, again, the hard but also a success has been about adapting and evaluating for priority populations. I think there's been a lot of good work that's happened, particularly in the men's suicide prevention space with the trials. I think thinking about the different types of men and their needs and what organisations are already there and working with that to um, develop sort of really actionable suicide prevention work. Um, we've had a lot of success in putting world's best programs on behalf of um, communities. I think so much of this work has been really pioneering and hard and the opportunities for sites to come together in forums like this or forums that Black Dog has run has been really valuable to kind of build that community of practice around um, the suicide prevention workforce. And a really important um, development has been the lived experience framework. We've seen a significant increase in the safe and meaningful engagement of people with lived experience of suicide in all our trial sites. And they're really important part of the piece and no doubt a really important part of the piece of men's suicide prevention as well. Um, so just a little bit more on that, what we've learned. As I said, the local networks and the collaborators, uh, sorry, coordinators and the inclusive cross-sector governance has been really important. Um, In-depth induction of suicide prevention systems approaches, I think it's really important to have a really solid understanding of what evidence is and where the research is and what the best impact, the best um, impact for investment will be. But also how to marry that up with community need and readiness, um, which ties into co-design of programs. Um, we've really pushed sites to evaluate any innovative programs. I think sometimes, well, actually most of the time, suicide prevention evidence is scant. It's hard to get that follow up particularly on absolute deaths over time, because while each death is a tragedy, the incidents often remain quite rare, particularly in a geographically spread area like Australia. So it's hard to get follow-up data on um, those primary outcomes. So we've really pushed for, for as much um, evaluation as possible for innovative and priority population programs. And one thing we're seeing, particularly in the men's space, and Black Dog's really keen on this, is looking at online and tech solutions. Um, We've spoken to DVA about a bit about this as well. It's sort of the an, an anonymous nature of some of these online things that might be uh, a first step in getting help and finding support. And this could be quite applicable for men in the future. And again, lived experience engagement has been really powerful across all the trials. Um, I also like this cartoon. Uh, in suicide prevention work, it's really hard to know sometimes when you're doing good prevention. Um, some of the work we've seen might not pay off in two or three years in terms of uh, fall in deaths and attempts, but it really um, might have 
done some really important groundwork around stigma reduction or some really important groundwork around local collaboratives of who needs to come together to do good suicide prevention in their communities. And just a little bit on upcoming uh, black dog work in suicide prevention, as I'll wrap up with this. Um, so black dog has a pretty strong goal to reach the 60% of the population who do not seek help for depression, anxiety and suicide risk. And so we see men's suicide prevention as a big part of this this um, goal. So thinking about it in terms of advocacy, research and some social enterprise work we're working on, as I mentioned before, we're looking at, well, we've been lobbying the government hard on a permanent systems-based national suicide prevention program. Long-term funding is needed. These three-term funding cycles have to go in suicide prevention work, um, particularly for priority populations. So tied to that is invest in the research. We need to know what's working, not just what's been worked overseas, but what works in Australia, what works for Australian men, what works for the intersectionality of Australian men. So really investing in that um, knowledge and then consolidating the learnings. So currently, so many trials have happened in the last few years and so many evaluations are happening around systems approaches of suicide prevention. There's the New South Wales trials, the ACT, the National um, Victorian Place-Based Trials and a whole bunch of local evaluations. So um, really pushing the government hard on how this is consolidated because I think there's a really massive opportunity for Australia to demonstrate to the world and to Australians what we do know and have learned and want to keep doing in suicide prevention work in Australia. Um, on the research and data column, um, as I flagged, we've got quite a bit of work to do around um, analysing the, the New South Wales data for that demographic insight. Um, we are working in an ongoing way with different data bodies to keep collaborating and feeding back um, data recommendations. We find that sometimes the data is poorly coded at the collection point, and so we're looking at some standard ways and ways of helping ambulance and police um, not miscode this information. So we have a more accurate picture of suicide in Australia. And just announced a week and a half ago, maybe, um, the federal government announced um, Black Dog would get 3.7 million for under the radar project, which is really to research and develop digital services for people at risk of suicide but have not sought help through formal channels. And again, men is very much the focus of this study and this um, sort of online stepped clinical service which is being developed. And we also, um, in my team, are looking at a bit of a social enterprise model. Our funding ends in the next year or so, but we've learned so much and the communities have come together and learned so much that we want to be able to keep this going in some sort of viable way. So we're looking at keeping um, a kind of community practice going with um, willing suicide prevention regions, um, collaboratives and regions. Um, we've also managed to get good access to national coronial data. We now have blanket ethics approval to access the entirety of the data for Australia. We used to only have access for particular trial regions, but now we have it um, nationally we're able to provide the kind of um, data that I explained before, but with much more granular information about hotspots and means and things like that to any PHN that needs it. Obviously this costs quite a bit of money, so, um, but it's available and we can do that analysis um, for PHNs. And um, the other thing we really wanna keep pushing is capacity building um, PHNs and partner organizations for best practice suicide prevention research and implementation. That's where I will leave you. I might have a look at um, if any questions have come up that I can answer. Thanks, Lyndall. It was uh, really thorough and really, um, really insightful. Um, I mean, one question that popped up for me, and it's very sort of quite a granular question, but you were pointing to the um, those two bits of data. One was on the uh, QPR and uh, one was on the community survey. You said you didn't have the outcomes yet, but I wondered, do you have a sense of, of how many people doing the QPR and how many people in the community survey are men and women? Um. I don't have those numbers, but it's up in the thousands and thousands that have done QPR. Um, 
I'm not sure what the gender breakdown is on that yet. Um, it's a question from Tony McManus about why Region A is not identified. Uh, it's just an ethics thing. Um, one of the really important things with suicide data in a public space like this is we have to protect um, the, comp the privacy of the people in that data. So one of our requirements with the National Coronial Information System is to not is to obfuscate those things as much as possible. If that uh, the PHN we're working with, they obviously have um, much more um, access to that data and they know exactly the regions and the postcodes we're talking about. It's just uh, when we start broadening the audience, we have to clamp down on the on what information is available. The last thing we want is the Daily Mail or Telegraph report on uh, some hotspot or something like that in a particular region in Australia because that can lead to unsafe um, risks around suicide in their community. Thanks, Lyndall. I've got a quick data question for you as well. Um, how that breaking down between that's really interesting what you said about um, never married, married, and, and in, in some way separated and it is split in thirds. Um, how do we distinguish between um, sort of people who aren't married but in a relationship and people who are never married? So within that never married one third, presumably there's lots of, it's not just single blokes, there's lots of people in um, whatever you would call them, common law relationships. Uh, they're included in the married number. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So de facto is in the married number, and that these these groupings come from the ABS in how they organise their information. So our data team has um, overlaid different data sets to get that information. Right. And you sort of uh, referenced the the higher rates in separated men. Have you got a sense of? The, the rates between those three groups, single, married, and separated in some way? Uh, separated was by far the highest rate. Right. So separated is a smaller number, but the proportion of those men who go on to hurt themselves in suicide um, is quite high. Yeah, any sense of the never married to married? I'm not sure. There could be young men. Sure. There could be... Um, I'm not sure. It could be people with just, I don't, I don't know. We, it's really hard to get that kind of information. And I think as well, once, uh, again, it's about that privacy and what's revealed in coronial information and things like that. So. Got it. Thank you. If just there's no more questions, I might go because I have another meeting, but, um, Yep. But people can feel free to email me and I can get back to you with um, a bit more information about the gender around who has completed um, QPR. Cool. That's really great. I really appreciate you taking time, particularly at such short notice. You've given us a really uh, thorough overview, um, both for those who have never seen it before, but also for those who are familiar with the model but interested to hear sort of the latest developments. Thank you so much uh, uh, for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.